this calamity in Texas, where a routine detonation turned to disaster. When you're using well over 100 kilos of dynamite, you really hope you've got things right. An explosion that made headlines for all the wrong reasons. Are you serious? What the heck is going on here? And a building that just wouldn't go away. Safe to say, this demolition didn't go to plan. Dallas, Texas is a big city with a southern can-do attitude. Journalist Sean O'Neill explains. The symbol of Dallas is a pegasus. It's an ordinary creature that becomes extraordinary. It's a workhorse that sprouts wings and flies up above everybody else. And that's Dallas in some ways. Dallas might have a reputation for its oil and its cowboys, but there's a lot more to this city than meets the eye. Dallas made its bones in oil, but oil is just one of the many things. It's just got its hand just about everything. It's always out there every day just selling itself. One of Dallas's boldest marketing ideas grew out of the long, baking hot summers. In the 1920s in Dallas, you had this place called the Southland Ice Company, and they were just selling ice out of their storefront. One of the employees, this guy named John Jefferson Green, he realized that you know, he could sell milk and eggs and bread and that sort of stuff out of their storefront. It was a convenience for people. The idea quickly caught on, and by 1946 was spread across Texas, renamed 7-Eleven. They decided after World War II to change their name to reflect the hours that they were open. By the 1960s, 7-Elevens were everywhere. In the 1970s, this fast-growing company needed a brand new headquarters. Built around three kilometers north of downtown, in typical Dallas style, it would be bold and strong at heart. Thomas Taylor was the principal design engineer. These are the original plans, and they were completed in 1971. I had this idea as a young engineer to make something more out of it than just a standard routine building. So we came up with the concept to actually use the facade, the, the expression of the building, actually use that as structural. Standing around 48 meters tall, the outside of the 11-story tower would be built from precast concrete panels and steel. But its real strength would come from within, supported by a solid cast-in-place concrete core that would both stabilize and provide structural rigidity. The whole purpose of the concrete core was to tie all the precast and steel floors with steel beams to the concrete core so they won't fall over. If this were a tree, that would be the tree trunk. These days, precast panels can be made strong enough to play a structural role. But back in 1971, they were mainly cosmetic, so this building's solid concrete core was essential. The primary purpose is to keep it from blowing over. It's a 11-story building with a plus a basement, so the wind pressures are pretty high. So obviously a core is extremely important because it's the whole lateral stability of the building. By the 80s, 7-Eleven had moved on, and in 2020, the tower was scheduled for demolition to make way for a $2.5 billion redevelopment. Built in the 70s, so, you know, that's 50 years ago, so that it had a good long life. Sunday, February the 16th, 2020, demolition day. There's two ways to demolish a building. One is just knocking it down with heavy balls or something, but then the other is to implode it. More than 100 kilograms of dynamite were primed and ready to go. When that first implosion hit, it took down everything else. It took down the steel bars, the windows, all the kind of frippery, if you will, and it just left this solid concrete core. Built to withstand hurricane force winds, the core had just stood up to more than 100 kilos of explosives, shaken but still standing. The core only dropped around 10 meters and was left with a tilt of 15 degrees. That's more than the leaning tower of Pisa. 
Local street artist Gerald Sestaita knew that this was too good an opportunity to miss. My brother called me and he said, uh, hey, did you hear about the Leaning Tower? I said, well, yeah, I know the Leaning Tower. Everybody goes, no, no, the one in Dallas. I said, what? So I came out here and the spectacle was something that I, I just had to, to capture. I hadn't seen anything like that. As Gerald memorialized the catastrophe on canvas, the core quickly became known as the Leaning Tower of Dallas. It became a real tourist attraction. People started going to it specifically to take photos like you would in Italy with the Leaning Tower of Pisa, you know, pretending to hold it up or kick it over or whatever. Well, the Dallasites kind of were fond of it. You know, this is our Leaning Tower. It was a fun time. One of them started a petition asking for it to be made a UNESCO World Heritage Site. There were calls to make it a permanent tourist attraction. Obviously, there's a lot of safety concerns with that sort of thing. But how had a supposedly routine demolition gone so spectacularly wrong? Engineers build structures to last, not fall over. So when you're planning to use explosives to bring one down, it's crucial to know exactly what you're blowing up. That's kind of how we built it back then. We didn't build them to make them easy to demolish. It seems the core might have been stronger and more stable than expected. This wasn't news to the tower's principal engineer. I wasn't surprised that the core was hard to come down. If they didn't have a proper number of charges or if the timing was bad or maybe a charge didn't go off at the exact time it was supposed to go off, maybe they undersized their charges, I don't know. One explanation was that the dynamite would blast the precast concrete and steel floors while cutting the core off at its base, toppling it to the ground like that tree. But one thing they might not have bargained on was the basement. If you look at it closely, it looks like it fell in the basement. So it actually did fall down. And I think maybe the rubble of all of this other stuff that was in there was surrounding the core. And so when it tried to fall over laterally, the rubble around it is probably what contained it and prevented it from being able to fall over. The core was wedged in and leaning at around 15 degrees. So on February the 24th, eight days after the blast, it was time for plan B, the wrecking ball. If they needed 135 kilos of dynamite to blow it up, you'd think they would need a giant wrecking ball too. But think again. To take down the 11-storey concrete core was a 2,500 kilogram wrecking ball just over one meter high. There was a silence in the crowd. And then there was the, a great exhale of, what the heck is going on here? Are you serious? Is that what they brought? What Dallasites were witnessing wasn't blowing them away. But I don't know how big a wrecking ball you can actually get, but you know, especially from a distance, it just looks like this little like cannonball just taking pot shots at this building. Literally, it looks like my paintbrush coming up to the side of the building here, and then... The ball would just bounce off of it and just bounce off of it. And eventually, the local news set up like a live stream. You could watch it 24 hours a day. All day long. That wrecking ball might have looked underwhelming, but at least it got the job done, eventually. On the afternoon of March the 2nd, 15 days after the blast, the Leaning Tower of Dallas finally leaned no more. It was over. It was done. Everybody stood around, everybody that was there. All that was left was just a pile of rocks. With the land now leveled, and despite the calamity, the Leaning Tower left a lasting impression on the city. It brought 
the community together and it allowed us to focus on something that was outside of ourselves. And one thing is for certain, the Corps was definitely up to the job. It does kind of prove that it was strong enough to resist the wind because it was what it was intended to do. Everybody in Dallas knows and loves the Leaning Tower of Dallas. The tower is gone, but it's not forgotten.